So we got another beautiful day here. Um, it's just lately this spring and summer it's been beautiful one day and perfect the next so I almost feel like I'm in New Zealand or something. But uh, today I wanted to show um, a really good drill especially for people under like 1800 feet a or so and it's called the big hammer, the big hammer drill. And just a real quick history uh, of how this drill came about. This drill was created by Chaz um, and uh, it is a spin-off or it's like an enhancement you could say of Michael De La Maz's concentric squares drill and the reason it's called the big hammer is because Chaz one of his grandparents last name was De La Maza just like Michael De La Maza except his Maza was spelled with two Z's instead of one Z and so in like Spanish and Italian his grandparents were from Sicily um, I think De La Maza was from like Spain or Catalonia or something but uh, in that region of the world the, the two Z's would mean Maza means hammer and so with two Z's it means like big hammer or bigger hammer so that's why this drill is called the big hammer because it was developed by Chaz uh, you know with two Z's Maza Chaz Maza with two Z's big hammer and so what I want to do is um, have you get your chess boards out and we'll go through the drill together I think that's the best way to do it and what you need is you need a chess board you need just one black king no white king for white all you need is one queen and then you need one of each piece so one knight one bishop one queen and one rook for black and then what we'll do is down in the show description I have a list of different pieces and then squares. Now Chaz was really awesome and sent me these cards, but um, after he kind of um, came up with this drill, I did it and I just uh, took playing cards and I just took the squares and I wrote like knight h3 and I'll have a list of all these squares down in the show description so you don't have to figure them out on your own, you can just copy the squares. Um, and make your own cards whether you want to use index cards or however you want to do it but traditionally um, in the De La Maza drill um, it was called the concentric square drill and I'm not going to go through all that um, I'll put a link to a video up here if you want to see it's kind of a long video some people might think it's boring but it's what I think was hit, uh, De La Maza's intended means of doing the drill um, but he would do a, a rook and he would go around in a concentric square get bigger 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 and then he would you know, go to like a knight and then a, a, a bishop and a queen. Um, so it would always be like the same drill over and over and over. And Chaz came up with a really awesome idea. And what he did is he made cards for each piece that we're gonna do this drill with. And then he did squares where the drill works. And um, we'll go through that here. And I'll start with the rook and explain how this works. Um, so, basically you put the king on d5 the king always goes on d5 and then what we'll do is we'll shuffle up these pieces we just kind of shuffle the pieces you know so we don't know what's next and we'll draw the cards from the top and the first square that we get is a2 so we put the rook on a2 so we keep the black king always stays on d5 then we put the piece on whatever square we draw and then what we do is when we put that uh, piece uh, on that square that we draw we have our white queen and we look for all squares where we can have safe and successful skewers or forks so in this thing with the rook on a2 the king on d3, safe, safe skewers would be g8 and f7, right? The king has to step aside, we would take the rook. We also have a safe fork or double attack here on b3 because it hits a2 and it hits d5. And so those are all safe and successful forks or skewers. So when we when we're done with that one, now you note there's not any other ones. So like this would be a this would be a fork, but it would it would it would 
but it would not be successful because, or it wouldn't be safe because he could take our queen. So we cannot put our queen, say, on g2 um, because it's not safe from attack. And so in his drill, it depends how much time you have, but you could go through all the squares. Now the cards and, you know, these squares that I have in the show notes are only squares where there is a safe and successful um, skewer or fork. So if it's a square, like, let's say, you know, like, in this deck of cards, we would not we would not have C4 because there's no way that you can safely and successfully skewer that rook and capture the rook because the black king would just stay in contact with the rook. So you would never you would never be able to successfully win that rook. And so these these cards are curated to only have squares that are that are successful. So the next square I drew just randomly is c1 so we would move the rook to c1 and then we would look for safe forks and skewers well there's no there's no skewers because these are not on the same line or diagonal right they're not on the same rank file or diagonal so there's no skewers but there is uh, a successful fork here actually there's two of them so d2 is a successful fork because it's safe as soon as the king moves away, we take, so that's successful. And g5 is actually a successful fork or double attack, however you want to prefer to say it, but um, we would be able to end up winning the rook on c1. And so then what you can do is you can, you know, you can go all the way through the, the cards with the rook if you want to, or you can move on to other pieces. And that's what I think, like, I think this is really a cool idea because when you just go around in a square, it becomes repetitive. Like when you're on like day 10 or something, you start to get so you memorize everything and then you kind of lose focus. Well, this, you, if, the, if the card is in the deck, you know that there's a safe and successful fork or skewer somewhere. Um, and so, you know, it maintains your, helps you maintain your focus doing this and it doesn't get repetitive because, you know, we have randomized orders of these. And so this can be done for all the different all the different pieces. So let's move to say uh, a queen. Now a queen, there's not going to be as many squares where it'll work, but we'll just shuffle the pieces here. Shuffle them like this, and I'll move the rook aside for now, and we will draw one, and we drew h1. So we put the black queen on h1, and we look for successful uh, forks or skewers. Well, basically with the queen, we're only gonna get skewers, right? Because uh, we wouldn't be able to attack it, uh, double attack it in any square where it couldn't grab us. But safe um, from h1, the safe, we take our white queen, and we physically make the moves on the board. So we would tap a8, which is a successful skewer, checks, king moves away, takes. But for the purpose of the drill, we just look for it and we place it on the board. So a8, b7, then we would draw the next card, or we would go to the next one, which is d2. So we would put the queen on d2. We would say, okay, d8, d7, both successful skewers, and go through the deck. And likewise, we would do it with all of the pieces. So let's just do one with the knight. I'll just shuffle it really fast. And you'll notice the knight, there'll be a lot of there'll be a lot of them because you can it can be, you know, anytime that there's some distance between the black king and knight, you'll probably have some successful skewers and double attack. So let's see. So we draw e3 so we take the black knight we put it on e3 and we know that there's a successful double attack or skewer well we know there's no skewer because they're not on the same file rank or diagonal so we look for successful double attacks and then we just place the queen on the squares that are successful so we place the queen on d3 
and that's a successful double attack or fork, right? The king can't come to e4 to protect it, right? And so we will successfully win this knight. And so there's uh, no other successful squares here, because if we, you know, say we get something like this, the king can go over to protect it. If we went here, the knight could interpose, right? But we do have this successful square right here. So all the cards in these, which are down below, all these coordinates for each piece will have a successful um, attack for, for white. And then one thing to note is on the bishops, we have light squares and dark squares, uh, light squared bishops and dark squared bishops in here. Um, and I won't go through it, but it's the same thing. You just look for successful double attacks or skewers. And then if you want to like step it, so you could go through each um, set if you want to, depending how much time you have that day, you could say, okay, I'm gonna do rooks today, queen tomorrow, knights the next day, bishops the next day, however you wanna do it. Um, and then if you wanna make it more um, complicated after you get pretty good at doing this and you feel like you see the, see the board quickly, the key is to just improve your chess vision and get to know the board better because you're learning the squares as you put them down. Um, you know, you'll start to see like the interconnection of the squares better um, and just be able to hopefully see the whole board more quickly. Um, it it kind of helped, helped me a lot doing like the regular stuff and then um, this idea of Chaz I think is really awesome. So um, another thing you can do if you want to is you can combine you could combine cards um, and say, let's say, like, let's put a rook on here. So we got, we say rook h1. So we'll throw a rook on h1. And we could also throw another piece on here. We'll just randomly draw a knight card. b1. Okay. And then we, then we can uh, say, okay, well, what squares can we successfully win one of these pieces, right? Well, we're not going to be able to win the knight because it's protected by the rook, right? So there's no sense even trying to look for, for ways that we could um, get a double attack on. Oops, I'm gonna have to get this put away real quick. I don't want these blowing away. So we'll kind of end after this drill, but, so, but we can, we do have successful attacks on the rook so we would have skewer on h8 i'm sorry on a8 on b7 we would have a double attack on g2 on f3 so um yeah i would i would i would seriously try this especially if you're under like 1800 or so um odds are you could use some improvement in your board vision um another thing you could do is when you draw the cards try to um Picture the square in your head before you put the piece down there, before you look at the board. Draw the card, try to picture the square, try to say what color it is, um, so you get to learn these squares better. And then if you want to take it a step further, you could even say, okay, I mean, there's all kinds of little different things you could do as long as you're doing this. You could say, okay, um, let's say you, you got the rooks out and you um, drew C3. You could say, okay, without looking at the board, okay, C3, it's a dark square. You could even, if you wanted to, in your mind, try to look at the end of the diagonal. So A8, I mean, sorry, A1 and H8, it's on the long diagonal. E1, E1 to A5, it's on that diagonal. You could picture that in your head if you want. Um, the other thing you could do is you could say, okay, what's the corresponding square? What's the equivalent mirror image square of that square? And so what I mean by corresponding square is not like from endgame, not corresponding squares in endgames, but corresponding squares on the board like the equivalent square. So the equivalent square of C3 is F6. If you kind of imagine a imaginary line going down this long light squared diagonal and you had a mirror, they would reflect each other and they have very similar properties, right? Like um, you, you kind of notice these, these, these uh, properties as you go, but so like the corresponding square of A1 would be H8 of F1 would be C8, you know. Most simply, like D5 would be E4, right? D4 would be E5, and so on and so forth. And then you'll kind of notice patterns on how these kind of squares um, tie together. So, for instance, 
okay, let's say the corresponding square of C4, right, would be F5. And you'll start to notice little nuances. Okay, also, so white's uh, light squared bishop can develop to C4, and black's light squared bishop on C8 can develop to F5. And you'll start to notice all these patterns. And so, um, yeah, I thought I'd just make a quick video, put this out there. Um, I'm gonna try to start doing it more often. I was doing a pretty good job of it, and then I kind of fell off of it as I was trying to pound out. I'm almost done with step three, the chest steps. Um, but um, I'm gonna start trying to do this at least like four times a week or so, and then I'll just kind of mix it up. Sometimes I'll just do one thing, sometimes I'll do multiple cards, sometimes I'll incorporate these vision things as I do it. But um, anyway, that's called, that's the big hammer drill from Chaz. Um, Chaz Mazza with two Z's and um, we thank Chaz for coming up with that drill because it's a I think it's really I think it's really cool it's uh, not so boring um, it's not so repetitive as the regular concentric squares drill and you don't waste time on squares where there's no um, there's no safe for successful capture I know there's there may be some small value in that just realizing that it's not safe but um, I think you know, just in the interest of time for adult chess improvers, you got limited time and energy and ambition. And um, I think this is a really good drill. So anyway, we'll catch you next time. I uh, hope you got something from that. And I hope you actually start using that drill because it's, uh, it'll, it'll, you'll be surprised. Try it for a month and see if you start seeing more. I think you'll especially notice it in like blitz chess. So take care.